evening all, and welcome. Tonight, we're going to be embarking on some truly horrifying stories. But be warned, the nature of these is quite disturbing indeed. But without further ado, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I was about 200 metres away on Wall Street, in front of the squat J.P. Morgan building, when the second plane hit, and I saw the reflection of the fireball in its windows. Then, the shockwave percussed the window I was looking at, and it looked like the entire window opening was full of liquid fire. Then the sound knocked me over and the street was full of people running away. We went around the corner towards the damage, and saw bits of what could have been undercarriage in the street, and a guy at a window above the scar, waving his shirt for help. Then that first guy was gone, and then the person who, I assume, had pushed him out, was also out the window, and then maybe five more. There were maybe a hundred people standing there with us. Even after we turned and headed back to our office, we could still hear people landing. We rushed back to our own office on the 24th floor of our own building, when the first Trade Center building fell. All I saw was vertical walls of dust go past 24 floors up. By the time we got down and out, the dust was starting to settle. I saw mangled bodies of people killed by falling rubble, who had been standing while I had been sightseeing just 18 minutes earlier. I was on the ramp for the Brooklyn Bridge when the second building fell. The weirdest thing I saw that day was a cop fruitfully directing traffic at the bridge on ramp. He had no shirt, just a singlet, and you could see his tattoos that would probably have been hidden beneath the uniform. There was some hardcore stuff there, and the guy was solid like a beast. Yet he was there standing in the middle of the road, crying his eyes out. That was the moment I started to become aware that I had just seen some shit. I had an older nephew that worked in the school system and always kept his ears open for property that was for sale. He came by our house one Sunday afternoon, looking kind of shaky. He wanted my dad to come see something strange at this house that he was going to buy. Being a brat, I wanted to go too. And my dad relented and took me with him to shut me up. After all, we were just looking at a house, right? When we arrived, I realised I knew of this house that was built up on a little rock bluff that was higher than the ground around it. My nephew took us down into the basement, and on its brick wall, there was a steel door, like a boiler room. He opened it, and there was a spiral staircase cut down through the stone bluff, leading down to yet another room, with a vent, to another room carved out of the massive stone bluff. It was padded, had a bench, and was very worn looking. The hair raised on my neck, as I realised that this house was connected with a 40-year-old rumour that the owner had a crazed daughter sent off to an asylum in Chicago many years ago. There was an alternate scary tale for children and Halloween that told that she never left. He just said she did, and that she had imprisoned her in the house until she died. A local postman who was a friend of my dad told him many years ago that he had to have the homeowner sign for a package and went to the front door, and heard screaming coming up from the basement as the guy signed the package. That room was real, 
The scary Halloween tale portion was probably real too. I looked up to my dad, who had this strange look on his face, and he and my nephew started making up some tale about how it must have been used to store grain to keep me from a kid from shitting my pants. When I was 13, I watched my mum get viciously attacked by our dog. We were standing in the dining room talking when our family dog, a Shiba Inu named Zeus, dropped a toy at my mum's feet. She would throw the toy for him a few times. Zeus would run, tackle it, and bring it back. So on and so forth. Nothing out of the ordinary. We had finished our conversation, and I was walking away. Zeus strutted by me, toy in mouth, on his way to drop it at her feet, when she got down on the floor to play with him. Something about seeing her on all fours and the toy between them made him go into psycho-protective mode, and he lunged at her face with the loudest, worst growl slash bark I have ever heard. The whole thing lasted about a minute. We just rounded the corner when I whipped my head back to see my mum standing up and her face covered in blood. The only thing clear were her eyes. Her bottom lip was barely attached, just hanging from her face, and her nose was split three ways. Tons of blood. She was just cupping her hand underneath her chin to catch anything while she walked to the bathroom. She just stood over the sink and let the blood drip in and cried into the mirror. I yelled if I needed to call an ambulance and she just nodded. I think we were both in shock at that point. I mean, this dog weighed maybe 20 pounds. Little fluff of a curly tail, and a cuddle muffin by all accounts. And he just practically ripped her face off. Anyway, the ambulance came and got her. I put the dog outside on the run. He was acting super ashamed at that point. He wasn't being mean. He just knew something really bad happened. He just sat on the step and put his head down as I closed the door. That was the last time I saw him. Once at the hospital, she needed a ton of stitches. She was in denial about the whole thing and blamed herself for being on the floor when he was just being a dog. He thought I was going to take his toy, she said and she told them it wouldn't happen again, and begged them not to take him. He had to be put down the next day. It was super scary, and a totally horrible series of events. I mean, that dog was the nicest dog ever. It barked an awful lot, but otherwise was a great family pet. Just one thing snapped that day, and he was done for. Still to this day, the scariest thing I have ever witnessed. We were the first on the scene at a terrible car accident when I was nine. I was with my grandmother when we pulled up onto a car turned sideways in the middle of the road. The driver's neck was broken. He was dead on impact. The passenger's arm was completely ripped off and she was bleeding out. The back seat passenger side was a little boy with his femur sticking out of his leg, and the back seat driver side was a little girl completely unharmed, trying to wake up her mother, who was the driver. My grandmother was stripping me naked to use my clothes as tourniquets. She saved the passenger's life. I drank ginger ale for a week before I could put down food. A little bit of counselling, and I pulled through just fine. This was the scariest shit I'd ever seen. I'm 33 now, and still remember every detail. My grandpa killed himself when I was 15. I had always been really close with him, 
even though he lived about eight hours away in Missouri. I would make my mum and dad call him when I was a kid, so that he could tell me about Jack and the Beanstalk. He probably told me that story a thousand times, but told it with just as much enthusiasm for every performance. My father had been married once, before he met my mother. I don't know much about her, and my father hasn't spoken about her to me once. But my mother once told me that she took birth control without telling my dad, and convinced him he was sterile. Keep in mind, this was probably before these kind of tests were widely used, like they are today. My father was an only child, and as a result, my grandparents never thought they would actually be grandparents. Cut to one surprise, and eight months later, here I am. My grandparents absolutely adored me, and when they were in town, or I was at their house, it was all about me. My grandpa was a painter, and did his art in an attic space above the house, which he climbed a ladder to reach nearly daily, all the way up until he died at 89. He would always take us up there to play on his typewriter, while he painted a portrait of me. For how much he loved me though, I think he probably loved my grandma even more. By the time I was a teenager, my grandmother had already developed advanced Alzheimer's, and was no longer recognising me as her grandson, but rather a younger version of her own son from 50 years before. My mother tells me that my grandma most likely had Alzheimer's since I was born, and had shown signs since she met my father. Once I was in high school, she was completely gone, and no longer had the ability to function. My grandpa had been taking care of her already for years, but with his age, was no longer able to keep up and put her in a facility. She advanced to the point where she had forgotten how to swallow, and my grandfather demanded a feeding tube to be put in. At this point, without living with her for a year or two, he'd already begun to slip into a deep depression, that I was too young and naive to notice, or too hormonal to care. In October, I was sitting in English class when the intercom buzzed, and asked to have me come to the front office to check out. From the moment the intercom tweeted, I somehow knew this was going to be a turning moment in my life. I had assumed it was my grandmother, and was almost relieved, but also had a deep sinking feeling in my chest that there was more. I turned the corner to see my mother, one of the most uplifting spirits you will ever encounter, looking more solemn than I had ever seen her. We walked in silence for nearly the entirety of the main hallway, and I could sense that she kept trying to tell me. Finally, she just said, It's your grandfather. Now, he had already lashed out at my father multiple times, because my father had been trying to get him to move to be closer to us, and nearly had when my grandpa left him at a gas station in the middle of the Ozarks on the move day. It wasn't until we got to the car that she told me all of what happened, that my grandpa had shot himself and that he was dead. I didn't sob. I didn't ask why. I didn't really even breathe. And for two more days until the funeral, I didn't even speak. It wasn't until my dad spoke up in front of the community that had watched him grow from being a baby to a man about the wonderful man that was my grandfather that I began to break down. He told everyone about my grandpa's war record, his role in the delivery of the Japanese surrender, about his vast portfolio of artwork that found its way across the country about the filling station he founded and ran for four decades, 
or his role as a community leader. My dad stood up in front of all his peers, who had watched his own father slowly slip into melancholy and darkness and said, My father was a great man. And then he turned to look straight at me in the eye, both of us fighting back tears with every ounce of emotional strength we could muster as he finished his thoughts. My father is a great man. Following that statement, I completely broke down as the emotion I had been repressing for 48 hours came rushing to me. I was angry at my grandfather for a very long time, even angry at my father, because I thought he somehow had something to do with it. My grandfather had caused my family an unbelievable amount of pain, as he had made no preparations and left us to deal with all his loose ends. After his death, I had, and to a lesser extent continued to have, a run of bad luck where it felt like life kept throwing me a curveball made of shit. Grades slipped, lost a lot of my musical inspiration and motivation. In college I started experimenting with drugs, but nothing harder than LSD. I liked them, because they helped me bring back a lot of that inspiration I had been missing. My grades continued to be a problem and I started to develop a complex about my intelligence. I met a girl at the beginning of my second year of college, and fell deeply in love with her. And we moved in together, but she ended up not being the person I thought. She talked down to me, and belittled me, and insulted me about my own intelligence because I got bad grades and she did not. I had fallen into a definite, moderate depression, and following the discovery that she had cheated on me nearly the entire time with the very person I had always expressed a problem with her seeing, he was her first. Keep in mind, this was after she had convinced me to stop being friends with one of my only friends at the time because it made her feel uncomfortable. After she broke my heart, my depression turned deep. And I started thinking about killing myself. I felt like I had no future, was stuck with Elise but had no money to try and look for other options. I blew all my money on my drug habit. I alienated myself from everything I cared about, my friends, family. I got myself expelled from my fraternity and I started hoping, even praying, that I would get hit by a bus or shot or get into a car accident. I wanted to die, to stop feeling like this. It finally got to the point where I was thinking about how I would do it, when I started thinking about what my dad would say or feel when he found out. Keep in mind that I was feeling betrayed by everyone in my life at this point. My grandpa left me. I thought my dad was the fault for my grandpa. I thought my mom was forcing me to do school when I desperately just wanted to come home and curl into her lap. With all these thoughts though, it still kept coming back to my dad standing in front of the community and that I couldn't do that to him. I called my mother who knew I was depressed in tears and told her that I wanted to come home that I didn't think I could handle life without help anymore. Of course, my mother being the wonderful woman she is was very supportive and had wanted me to come back for a long time, but also wanted me to make my own mistakes and decisions. It's been now nearly a year since I'd given up all hope of ever having a future. I have a job that pays well and the potential for a long and healthy career if I want it. I have an amazing downtown loft in a historic building, and have two wonderful cats, and a collection of vintage film equipment that I am quite proud of. But most importantly, I have hope, and I'm here. And it wasn't until just the other night that I realised why I am here. Because of my grandfather, 
because of the pain that I saw that his selfishness had caused my family. Truly understanding the consequences of that action kept me from jumping one night. And while I know my grandpa didn't plan this, and I don't believe it was all part of someone's plan, it probably doesn't even mean anything. I just really needed to tell someone about that realization as I can't bring myself to talk to my friends about my own previous suicidal thoughts. I hope my story means something to someone, or they can maybe realise they've been in the same situation. I grew up in Nigeria, and saw a man get hacked to pieces in front of his family. This was during the 2001 Joss Christians vs Muslims sectarian crisis. The Muslims had set a fake roadblock along an express and were asking travellers the learnings of their faith compasses. I guess the guy gave the wrong answer. You should also understand that there was no turning back since there was a hold up stretching for miles and you had no idea what was happening until you got closer. I was in the back seat with my two older brothers. My mum and dad were in the front with my baby sister who was just four years old at that point. As soon as we saw the man dragged into the bushes, every motorist started horning. We were sitting ducks. My mother threw up and started murmuring prayers, while my father told us to bend down at the back. I think he was going to try to plough through the roadblock. Luckily for him, another poor soul did, only to get sprayed with machine gun fire. The rest of the motorists took that as cue and sped away from the scene. I lived in Brazil from 2011 to 2013. I saw some crazy stuff there. Stuff I had never imagined I would see. Some scary things that I remember are as follows. May 2013. I saw a guy down an alley on his knees, get shot in the head, execution style. October 2012. I was visiting a man, and sitting in his front room, when the front door opened and another man came running through his house, carrying a black backpack under one arm, and a pistol in his free hand. He rushed out the back door, passing right in front of the three of us, who were sitting on the couch. The man we were visiting cleared his throat and said, Please excuse me, and I assumed he was standing up to close the front door. But no, he pulled a pistol from his waistband and walked out the back door. My friend and I heard three distinct gunshots, and then our host returned a moment later, holding a black backpack. He closed the back door, closed the front door, sat down and said, You may go on, and crossed his legs like nothing had happened. Easter 2013 A protester in front of a Catholic church with its sign that said, God hates Christians, love the Jews, was screaming and raging at the priest inside during their services as the chapel doors were open. I was across the street waiting for a bus and watching this guy. Slowly, one of the priests walks out of the chapel and right up to the protester. He spoke quietly and calmly with him, made the sign of the cross, then returned to participate in the service. The protester stopped screaming, lowered the sign down, then slowly backed into the street. I looked at my friend who was next to me and said something, taking my eyes off the protester. Suddenly, I heard this screech and a scream, and just remember seeing the protester get smashed by a speeding city bus. I can still clearly see the blood squirt out of his chest as he was impaled by one of those bike racks, and I can hear the screams and the crunching of his bones as his legs were shattered underneath it. It was over in a second, and all that was left of it was his sign, which fell on the ground. 
ominously. The chapel doors shut immediately after. The scary part was that everyone around us, the two white Americans looking very out of place, continued about like nothing had ever happened. In July 2013, I saw a homeless man take a ship behind a bus stop. He dropped his pants, propped himself up against the bus stop bench, and exclaimed loudly from the satisfaction of the dump that was one of the biggest shits I'd ever seen. This man was clearly drunk from the smell coming off him, and the amount of bottles of chachaga, a popular Brazilian alcohol around him. There was a white cement wall opposite the bench that he was leaning against. And I see this other man, shirtless, hop over the wall, grab a bottle of cachaga, and proceed to pour it all over the drunk man taking a shit, and then drop a lit match on him. He erupted in flames and started screaming, while the shirtless man ran off laughing hysterically. In August 2012, I was sitting on a public bus looking at some photos on my cell phone when I felt a sharp sting on my right shoulder blade. A man was behind me and spoke very sharply in my ear saying, give me some money or something like that. He poked a knife into my shoulder again when I hesitated and I reached for my wallet and gave him a 20 note of race. He walked off and I had to clean my bloody shirt afterwards. It was scary, because that was the first time it happened to me. But it happened again one more time before I returned home. About a year ago, I came home from work to see the two little neighbors boys, both of two and four years, standing on their bedroom window. Second story house, facing mine. They called to me, and I waved, and then the screen fell out of the window, and the boys fell straight onto the concrete driveway. I swear, it felt like time stood still. The sound they made when they landed, and the stillness, immediately after, was horrific. I ran to the house to get their mother, and they started crying, and I fumbled my phone out and dialed 911. The way their mother screamed still gives me goosebumps to think about. We held the boys while we waited for the EMTs to arrive, trying to keep them both from squirming, and I tried to reassure their mother. They were both very lucky. One had a minor skull fracture, and the other needed stitches in his hand from where he hit a bush, but otherwise they were remarkably fine. They came by that Christmas and bought me some cookies. Super nice family. I am 47 years old and a huge fan of horror. I enjoy being scared and I often scare myself. This, however, was just beyond scared. This was heart literally leaping from my chest scared. I can honestly say that I'm not just saying that, like you might think. I felt the pain in my chest that would make you think you were about to die. The first time I felt this, I was in my late teens. I grew up in a small town that was the suburb of a small city. There was not much for my friends and I to do at night, but drive the main drag of the city and see who else was driving around. This was before cell phones and internet were a thing, so connecting with your friends once they had left their house was next to impossible. My friend Dennis and Louise would go out driving most nights in the summer. Sometimes we would waste an entire tank of gas just trying to find something to do. Still, we cranked up the radio and had a fun time, even on nights we couldn't find anything to do. One summer afternoon, while Louise and Dennis and I were bored and wandering aimlessly, she picked up food and said, do you want to go to the hermit house? I had no idea 
what she was talking about. But being really bored, I figured why not. And she began driving in the direction of the house, and I asked her what it was. She told me it was an abandoned house that had been owned by an elderly couple that hung themselves inside the house. Since the house had come in disrepair for many years, it was condemned. She said that recently, it had become a popular site for Satan worshippers. The police had apparently made arrests on a couple of occasions in recent months and found evidence of sacrifices, of some of which may have involved humans. We arrive at the house and found a field had fully grown around the house. We could only see the second floor from the road and there were metal cables that appeared to be coming from the sides of the house. Having grown up with four older brothers, and I myself being a bit of a tomboy, this was not going to deter me in any way. So we got out of the car and went to explore. There was a makeshift path leading around the back of the house, and Dennis headed that way. He yelled back to watch the cables. That drew my attention to the cable closest to me. The sun was high and bright, and I felt safe enough. My only concern was getting caught, because there were no trespassing signs posted everywhere. I ducked under the cable, and started pushing the overgrown grass out the way. I made my way around the side of the house. Dennis called out to me, when he realised I wasn't behind him. I yelled that I was going around the other side, and I made it to the other side to find that one wall had partially collapsed, and I could see into the living room of the house. A large wooden beam had fallen from the ceiling. I could just make out something hanging there. It took a moment for my brain to catch up to my sight. A thick frayed rope swung from the beam ever so slightly. I told myself there was no way it could be from the couple that hung themselves. It would have been cut down. I was sure of it. I blinked a couple of times, but it still swung there despite the fact that there was no discernible breeze. Next thing I knew, Dennis was standing next to me, saying, Hey, hey you in there? I had frozen, and apparently didn't hear them calling me as they came around the house. He turned to see what I was looking at, and whispered, Oh shit, let's get out of here. That's just creepy. So we went back into the car and left. The rest of the day was spent driving around aimlessly. We stopped by some friends' houses, but most of them had jobs. We didn't have much luck. We ended up at the mall, waiting outside of Louise's place of work. She finally got out at 5pm and we all went back to hers. After trying on outfits and doing our hair, we were ready to go out for the night. We hit the main drag and drove the length of it four or five times, but there were not many people out. We stopped at some friends' houses and hung out with each for a little while, but we were restless. Around midnight, we went back to the drag, but after a couple of trips, it became clear that this was just a boring night. And then Dennis suggests if we wanted to return to the hermit house. It's night. Louise immediately protested, but then Dennis said that we had been there that afternoon. I was driving, so I told Louise it would be fine, and I headed in the direction of the house. Dennis had driven last time, so I needed directions, and Louise was really freaked out and she kept telling different stories of things that were ruined to have happened there. Plenty of stories about human sacrifices. And she even told us that a friend of hers had narrowly escaped one of those houses down the street after being taken by a group of Satan worshippers. When we finally turned on the street, we were all pretty creeped out. The houses went about halfway up the road, and then... It was another half mile to the hermit house. We'd only passed a couple of houses, when the headlights blinked on and off. We were all sort of startled but kept going. They blinked a couple more times, staying off little longer each time until we passed the house. 
before the half mile stretch. At that point, the lights went out completely, and we all screamed. I immediately threw the car in reverse, then turned the wheel of the car around completely. The back tires caught in the ditch at the side of the road, and both my friends were screaming for me to get out of there. My heart was pounding, and I felt like I was in the middle of a horror movie. I threw the car in drive and jammed on the gas, freeing the car from the ditch. We began driving back towards the houses, and as soon as we reached the first house, the car's headlights came back on, and it was 2am by this point. We were all pretty freaked out, and we decided to call it a night, and I dropped them both off the next morning. I told my dad that something was wrong with the headlights of the car, then I explained how they went out, but left out the part about the scary house. It was several days later, when he told me he took the car to a shop and they couldn't find anything wrong. I don't know what guardian angel was watching over us that night, but I'm thankful that something was. My best friend's fiance called me to ask if I had seen my best friend. She hadn't heard from him in a few days and was getting worried. I tried calling, but he didn't pick up. So I told her that I would go over to his house on my way to work. His car was in his parking spot, but he didn't answer the door. I was getting worried. I knew where his spare keys were, so I let myself in. I called his name a bunch and got no reply. While I walked around his house, I turned a corner and saw the carpet and the horse soaked in blood. I ran to the doorway to his bathroom and I saw him. Apparently, he slipped on the bath mat while getting out of the shower and hit his head on the sink and bled out. The entire bathroom floor was covered in blood and he was bloated and various hues of black, purple, blue, yellow, and pink. The scariest thing though, wasn't that. It was her face when I told her that he had passed away. I had just moved to a new city and was living on my own for the first time. I worked late nights and rode a bike home a fair distance. It was about 1am and I was riding my bike home when I began to approach the local elementary school. The school was on the opposite side of the street, lit up from the inside with those orange lights they turn on at night. As I began to approach the school, I noticed something strange. I couldn't really make it out, but something seemed off. I stared hard, squinting to see it better as I got closer and closer. Then, as the school was directly across from me, I saw it. A little girl standing inside the school staring out at the door at me. I flipped my shit and pedaled my ass off. After a few moments, I kind of got a grip and looked back over my shoulder. And there she was, standing on the sidewalk staring at me. I rode home like a bat out of hell and avoided that street like the plague for weeks. Then, one day, I worked a day shift and figured, hey, it can't hurt to bike down that street during the day. So yeah, turns out during the day they have these two wooden cutouts of kids that they put up to mark the crosswalk. At night, they store them just inside the school. And the people who work at the school obviously didn't notice that one was apparently forgotten and left outside until later, making it appear as though the same child had been in both spots, and profoundly scaring the shit out of